Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of us. It's um, a little cloudy on my side of town, but I'll tell you what, my heart is warm with the love of Jesus. And I pray that each and every one of you is are having a similar experience. Again, this is God's cathedral in time, his holy and blessed Sabbath day, and so as we come each week, we want to say blessed Sabbath to each and every one of us. And in a very particular way, I realize that there may be many of us that are listening. As a matter of fact, I know that there are quite a few that are listening that do not keep the Sabbath as we do not understand it. And God loves you anyway, and maybe one of the reasons that you uh, are listening in at this time is because you want to know more about the Lord's Sabbath. And so each week as we begin, we want to share a Sabbath nugget with you. And today I want to give us the, the greatest example of Sabbath keeping. And that example is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He had just begun his ministry, just been baptized and then he was taken into the wilderness where he was tempted and overcame the devil. Praise God, there is a devil. Brothers and sisters, we're in a battle. And the Bible tells us that uh, uh, Jesus came and he went to Nazareth where he had was brought up. He went to the hometown and the people welcomed him and he uh, went into the church. But which day did he go into the church? The Bible tells us in the book of Luke, chapter 4 and uh, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue or the church on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. In other words, he not only demonstrated that he, the Sabbath is still binding in his life. We see here that from the very beginning, the scripture is clear that that's what he did. And then the minister gave him the uh, a scroll, the, 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 the Bible as we would call it today. And he went and he quoted from the book of Isaiah chapter 60. I'm telling them that the scriptures is fulfilled in their ears today. In other words, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, our example, chose the Sabbath day to declare to the world, to tell the world who he is and what his mission to planet Earth is all about. And putting all theological arguments, all philosophical concoctions or whatever they come up with to do away with God's Sabbath. Amen. Let's look to Jesus. He is our example. And the Bible says that that's what he did. And so we want to do it by God's grace. Father, we thank you for your great love and your mercy towards us. We thank you for sending your son Christ Jesus to live for us, to give us an example as to how we ought to live our lives. We thank you for his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. Thank you, dear Lord, for his resurrection. In a very special way, I pray this morning that you would inspire me with thoughts and words from on high, as yes, indeed, we talk about his resurrection. Father, we thank you that he's our heavenly high priest, and even now as we come, he heareth us. We pray this morning that you would remove from us anything that is not like thee. Fill us with your spirit, dear Father. Sanctify our hearts. Give us listening ears and receptive hearts, and that whatsoever is said and done today, it may be done to thy name's honor and glory. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 All right. It has been... One week now since most of you celebrated Easter, and I have a question for us today, and 
And that is, first of all, a couple of questions. The first one is, how many of you thought about the true meaning of Easter? And the second question is, have you considered, you celebrated Easter <laughs> last Sunday, but have you considered his resurrection throughout the week as you considered it since last Sunday? Oh, and I could hear that many of you might be saying the answer to the first question, we celebrated the resurrection because of Jesus Christ was resurrected from the tomb on the first day of the week. And my question to you again, is it really? I quote a famous historian by the name of Arthur Weger. And he, this, he, he lived uh, way back, I think it was in the 18th or 17th century, I don't remember exactly. But he wrote a book called Paganism and our Christianity, and on page 145 of his book, this is what he wrote. The church, the Roman church, made a sacred day of Sunday, largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun. In driving into church this morning, I passed by a church, and it had a sign that says, Sun service, 11 a.m. Think about that. Weigel continues, for it was the definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to the people by tradition and give them Christian significance. And so we see that Sunday first and foremost it's a pagan tradition of sun worship, which has been incorporated into the church. It has come to us through tradition, traditions that existed long, long before Jesus came and lived and was crucified. Another historian gives us some detail. His name is M. E. Walsh, and he wrote just about the same time, and this is what he said. This didn't come from my church. It is not, is it not strange that Sunday is about universally observed when the sacred writings, the Bible, or do not endorse it? Satan, Lord have mercy, the great counterfeiter worked through the mystery of iniquity, the ancients, the earlier Bible scholars and writers understood who the mystery of iniquity is. Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Oh yes. He goes on to write, Satan, the great counterfeiter worked through the mystery of iniquity to introduce a counterfeit Sabbath to take the place of the true Sabbath. Sunday. Mm -hmm. Sunday stands side by side with Ash Wednesday, Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, with Sunday, Corpus Christi, some of these I'm not even familiar with, Assumption Day, All Souls Day, or Halloween as we know it, Christmas Day, and a host of other ecclesiastical feasts, too numerous to mention, he continues. Well, this array of Roman Catholic feasts and fast days are all, are all man-made. None of them bear the divine credentials of the author of the inspired word. My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus, when asked what would be the sign of the end comes, in the book of Matthew chapter 24, he responded that take heed that no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name and claim that they are Christ and shall deceive many, many, False prophets, he continued, would arise and, and deceive many. And he didn't stop there. He went on to say, 
that if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. And what is deception? It's believing something to be true, when in fact it is a lie. Sunday sacredness, my dear brothers and sisters, it's a lie. But so many believe it to be true. I'm not here to condemn anyone. I'm here to preach God's word because that's why he has called me. Celebrating Easter, whether it be once a week on Sunday or once a year on Easter is not prescribed in the Bible. You could search the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you would not find where a single word where Creator God has asked us, intimated to us, suggested to us that we ought to keep Easter, that we ought to keep Sunday holy Amen. in honor of his resurrection. It is a pagan tradition of old that has been brought into the Christian faith. And as the historian says, it has been baptized. It has now been connected with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that Easter was being celebrated hundreds, yea, if not thousands of years before Jesus came upon this earth. But as the historian says, the pagans now brought it into the church and baptized it and has given it to God's people. And the whole world is deceived. It was the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD that decreed that Easter should be observed on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox, which occurs around March 21st. Easter, therefore, can fall on any Sunday between March the 22nd and the 25th. My dear brothers and sisters, it was not so. The Passover, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was on 14th Nisan. His resurrection was on the 16th. It just so happened. It just so happened that at that year that it took place, it happened to be what we call Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That has not changed. God has not tell us to celebrate his resurrection on the second Sunday following the uh, the spring equinox. No, that's not what he did. It is the mystery of iniquity according to the historian. It is mystery Babylon, the mud of harlots and abominations of the earth. Some of you may be asking, why is this man talking like this? Why is he even talking about Easter? Hasn't it passed? Hello. But is it really? I want to ask the question that how many of you that are listening to me are planning on going to church tomorrow on Sunday? Don't they tell you that this is a mini Easter? That every week you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and we have the grand celebration once a year? But as I mentioned to you before, the historians have pointed out that Sunday sacredness and, and Easter have absolutely nothing to do with worshiping the Creator. Amen. It has absolutely nothing to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it has nothing to do with your eternal salvation. And I know, and I know these are harsh words, but we're living in harsh times. And God is calling his people to come out of darkness into the marvelous light of his truth. These are man-made rituals and no man-made ritual can prepare you to meet your Savior when he comes. No man-made ritual or tradition, my dear brothers and sisters, could ask, could prepare you for what is about to come upon um, this world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is much more than the celebration of a day when you come together to sing and swing and continue to sin and celebrate. Oh, now 
That's not what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. As a matter of fact, there's no way in the Bible that you could find where the, the disciples come together to on a Sunday, on a Sunday, because Jesus resurrected on Sunday. Again, the historians tell us the source from where it came. The Bible tells us the source from which it came. But how, you may ask, how do I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? Or was it a fact? Was it real? Well, the answer to the second question is, yes, in fact, it is real. And we'll be talking about that today. But the question as to how we celebrate uh, his resurrection is answered by the Apostle Paul. In the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, the Apostle writes, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Celebrating Easter and, and Sunday is not calling you to put away sin out of your life. That's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. Paul continues, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as so many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus or were baptized into his death went down into the watery grave of baptism and come up in the newness of life to live a life that reflects the character of Jesus Christ to a doomed and, and dying world. That's how we celebrate Easter. Paul continues. Therefore we are buried with him in, by baptism into death. That like as Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of his father, the resurrection, even so we also should walk should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's what the resurrection is all about. It's not about worshiping the sun on the first day of the week. It's not about worshiping the sun God. It's not about keeping men's tradition. It's about reflecting Jesus Christ, his character of love and grace and, and mercy and compassion to a doomed and dying world. Jesus, Jesus, when he was about to go to the cross, he prayed to his father and that prayer is found in the book of John chapter 17, I invite you to go read the whole chapter, what a blessing it is. Amen. But in verse 21, this is what Jesus says. Oh, talking about his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his mission to planet earth, he says that they all or may be one, all of those that accept him, that they all may be one Father, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. That the world may know that a Savior has come. It's not by the celebration of a day, once a week or once a year, it's all about the transformation of the character from one of sin to righteousness. And Jesus says, if you want to, to celebrate me, you demonstrate to the world that I have come and lived and died. That's how we celebrate it. That's the power of the cross. It's the promise of the resurrection. The question is, do you really believe it? I pray that this morning as we share from the word of God that some heart would be touched and someone who may not have heard of things like these may come to accept Jesus. That they may come to make a determination to 
order their lives according to as he has ordered us, as he has laid out before us. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in writing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says in beginning in verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, <laughs> then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, our faith is in vain. I want you to know this morning the reason I'm preaching is because my faith is not in vain. I'm preaching this morning is because he was resurrected. It's a fact and we'll show it to you from the scriptures and secular sources uh, this morning. You know, brothers and sisters, our minds have been so corrupted by sin that when the truth is presented, we have a problem with it. When the truth is presented, the enemy calls his servants to go into the colleges and the universities and the seminaries and to pick up the book and to come up with what they call a higher criticism, which in fact is indeed a denial of God. Well, this is what God says, but could it have been so and so? Did it really happen? And I want to tell you this morning that most of the Christian world is corrupted. Oh, but God, in his mercy, is calling you even now out of the darkness of the world into, into his marvelous light. Paul continues, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. In other words, you're a liar. I'm a liar. Paul is a liar. Every preacher is a liar. Everyone that claimed to celebrate Easter is a liar if Jesus Christ was not, in fact, and indeed, arisen from the tomb. If ye be so dead, Christ right not, arise not. Uh, for if Christ rise not, then, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. In other words, if we don't have a hope in the resurrection, then... It has to be because that Jesus did not rise from the grave. I remember his friend Martha and Mary. Their brother Lazarus was sick and the message got to Jesus and Jesus never showed up until four days later, by which time he was dead and Martha ran to meet, uh, to meet Jesus and she fell at his feet and played in tears. And says, Lord, Lord, why haven't you come before? The story is in the book of John chapter 8. You could go back there and uh, 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 read it. And the, chapter 11, I'm sorry. And then she says to Jesus, Lord, if you were here, if you were here, my brother would not have died because I know that the scripture tells us you have promised us that you are the resurrection that, and when you shall come again in your glory, the dead would be resurrected. I'm paraphrasing, go read it. But Jesus answered and says unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. He that believeth in me, though he is dead, yet shall he live. And then Jesus asks the question, where did you all bury my friend, my good friend Lazarus? And they showed him, and Jesus told him to go and to move the stone away from the tomb, and then he called him back to life. Jesus demonstrated that the resurrection is not something just future, but it is even now, it was even then. For he demonstrated that, in fact, indeed, he is the life giver. Paul continues, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, we all are all in our sins. Celebrating a day, I keep coming back to that, does not take away our sins. You could celebrate all you want and sing and swing. Oh yes, and continue sinning, 
the cross, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, means absolutely nothing if your life is not transformed to be like Jesus. Amen. Then, they also which have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we have hope only in Christ, we have of all men most miserable. In other words, in other words, if you just believe that this is some story that we come and we celebrate once a year and we go back in the world and we continue to sin, we continue to live the same lives that we were living, then the cross is in vain. But I praise God it is not in vain. I praise God that for so many, we're not living in misery, misery, uh, in misery. we're not miserable because we believe in the power of the cross. We believe in the power and the reality of his resurrection. There was a gentleman by the name of Frank Morrison. He used to be an advertising executive and he grew up as a Christian, but like most Christians do as we grow up in the church, as you call it, there comes a time that you fall away, but he always believed in the man Jesus Christ, but having gone to college like so many of them today, he began to doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Mr. Morrison decided to do some research. He was a very intelligent man. And the research he decided is was going to prove that the resurrection was just mystical. He believed in the man Jesus Christ. He says, I believe he was just a good historical figure. But this resurrection business is just mystical. And he started out to, to write a book to prove his case. And as he did his research, the evidence that he unearthed now began to change his mind. He wanted to know what actually happened. It's a great book. I you could download it, you know, it's very cheap online. You could buy it. Great book. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, there's quite a bit that Morrison wrote in his book. But I just want to share with us this morning three of the things that Morrison, in his research, came up with. Part of which, as he wrote his book, he changed his mind, he changed the title of his book. Item number one, I'm going to share three of them with you, which he stated in his book, prove that the resurrection of Jesus is an undeniable fact. Where is the body? Amen. My brothers and sisters, if Jesus had not arisen, the very opposition and hatred that was manifested against Jesus, they would have delivered a body to prove that this man Jesus was a fraud. Amen. So Morrison asks, where is the body? He says that if you can't produce a body, then it's evident, number one, that he was risen. It is now almost 2,000 years. And down through the history of time, the amount of, of Jesus deniers and the innumerable fables that have circulated around his death, burial, and resurrection, I want to remind you that after almost 2,000 years, no one has been able to produce a body. Rome research item number two that he discovered. The Bible reports that after Jesus' resurrection, that the Pharisees, those that joined with the Roman state to crucify Jesus on the Sabbath day, Lord have mercy, they went to Pilate, the Roman governor, when they should be in the synagogue worshiping the Lord of the Sabbath, they find their way to Pilate to tell Pilate that he should secure the tomb, lest that Jesus, whom they call a deceiver,
that his disciples would come and they would remove the body and then claim that he had been resurrected. Oh yes, they knew about the resurrection, but they didn't believe it. And the Bible tells us that Pilate said unto them, Pilate said unto them that command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. That's what the Pharisees and them told him. Moving on to Pilate, it's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 63 to 66. Pilate says, you have a watch, go your way. Make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the tomb and setting the watch, putting someone to watch there. My dear brothers and sisters, if you wanted to, to die, in that period of time, what you would do is to go and to remove a Roman seal. You just don't remove a Roman seal. It's like President Biden passing a law and attaching his seal and you going and removing the seal from the law. You're just not going to do that. And in that environment, people knew that just to remove that seal, you would have suffered a faith just like Jesus or worse than he did. My dear brothers and sisters, you wouldn't have been able to do it by yourself because history tells us that the stone that was at the tomb, it weighed at least anyway from 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. And it was on an incline. Morrison discovered. So you would have to roll it up to remove it from the tomb. My question this morning is who moved the stone? Who moved the stone? My dear brothers and sisters, the third thing that I want to share with us from Morrison's book, which scripture, thank you Jesus, testified to is the impact of Jesus' resurrection. First and foremost, I want to ask you a question. Who would sacrifice their life for a myth? It is the very ones that turned away from Jesus. Peter denied him. Listen to me, brothers and sisters that after the resurrection, they were willing to go and to, to preach the gospel boldly, to tell the world that Jesus is written to the point of their lives. All the disciples were martyred except John of the 12. All 11 of them were martyred. Were they that foolish to die for a myth? But my dear brothers and sisters, as Morrison looked at the impact at the impact of Jesus' resurrection, he concluded that this had to be real. The Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter would say it to us in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. For we have not followed vain, followed cunningly devised fables. When we made unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses, he continues. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from, uh, 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 to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard and we were with him in the holy mount talking about the experience they had on the Mount of Transfiguration, now Peter, who had denied him, is now writing and telling the saints that this thing is real. It is not a cunningly devised fable. I not only encountered him on the Mount of Transfiguration, but I have seen him, I have touched him, I have felt him after his resurrection, after the tomb, after the stone was moved from the tomb, now Peter. Now Peter would be so emboldened after the resurrection that he, 
even when he was told by the leaders of the church not to preach in the name of Jesus. Peter decided that he ought to obey God rather than men, and so he went out preaching and teaching about Jesus, and on one occasion he healed a man. And the word got to the Sanhedrin, and so they sent an arrested Peter and, and brought him before the Sanhedrin, and Peter stood up and preached Jesus. Amen. The same one that they had crucified, the same one that burst the tomb, the same one that conquered death. And then Peter declared in the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name on the heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. No other name, Amen. because he's the only one that beat death, the enemy of all of our souls. But Peter, but Peter, demonstrated the power of God's resur of the resurrection of Jesus's resurrection how did he do it <clears throat> did he call the brethren to come together to sing and to swing and to and to celebrate oh no he did not oh no he did not even think of doing such a thing to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus but he clearly demonstrated the power of the resurrection before the Sanhedrin because even those, the very ones that were accusing him and were prepared to kill him for preaching about Jesus, the Bible records. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they took notice that they have been with Jesus, the power of the resurrection, a transformed life. My dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know that uh, Jesus is looking for some demonstrations of his power, for his, some demonstrations of his resurrection in these times in which we live. He's not calling you to go worship the sun tomorrow. He's calling you to demonstrate in your life like was demonstrated in the life of Peter and John that you have been with Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, whatever you believe about the resurrection, about its validity, I want you to know that the facts are undeniable that he has resurrected. Something has happened on planet Earth since Jesus' resurrection. A gentleman by the name of H.G. Wells was asked, he is a writer and author, a historian, he was asked, who left the greatest legacy on history? He wasn't even a Christian, I don't think. But he answered, boldly it is the test of Jesus mm. it is Jesus that has left the greatest legacy on human on the human family Jesus he says Amen. stands first Amen. but what is that legacy you don't believe in the resurrection you don't believe in the gospel let me share a few things with you, what has happened since the resurrection. It has changed the course of human history. Time is marked by his death, burial, and resurrection, B.C., before Christ, and A.D., in the name of our Lord. More books have been written about Jesus than any other person that has ever lived or would ever live. The greatest universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia, they were all started as Christian colleges, Oxford in England. They were all started because of the resurrection. You don't believe it? Let's continue. Jesus, Jesus, the principles of Jesus, 
were enshrined in the constitution of this great nation in which we live, that all men are created equal. That was his teaching. Because Jesus has risen, we have the bedrock for, for democracy and for human rights. Because Jesus recognized all human life as being valuable and equal in the eyes of God. Oh yes, and I know we haven't always lived up to the precepts of our founding as a nation, but if Jesus had not resurrected, where would they have gotten the idea that all men are created equal? Jesus placed a high value on all people, men and women. He is the number one women's a liberator. It was the women that were first at the tomb. It was the women that came and preached the gospel to the disciples. Hey, church leaders out there that are saying that women ought not to preach and teach in the church. Take it up with Jesus. Because he showed that not only they can and they're able, he used the woman at the well to go tell a whole town Amen. that she has met the Messiah. Oh yes, ladies, you're very precious in the heart of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh yes, Amen. humanitarian works around the world. The Red Cross, World Vision, Samaritan's Purse, Mercy Ships, the Salvation Army, and my own church, Adra. They impact the world. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so Frank Morrison had a change of heart. As he wrote the book, he changed the title from whatever it was going to be. And the title that he is now known by, it's Who Moved the Stone? Who Moved the Stone? Because he was utterly convicted that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave, just the secular evidence alone. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that uh, this morning, another Christian writer, not a Christian, this individual is a Christian, he was the founder of Harvard Law School. To those of you that are into law, Greenfield wrote the rules of evidence. Every courtroom that you go into in this country, you see brothers and sisters, every lawyer that goes to law school, he studies Greenfield, uh, uh, Greenfield uh, 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 rules of evidence. It is enshrined in our legal system and Greenfield declares Greenfield declares, just from a secular perspective, if you apply the rules of evidence surrounding Jesus' death, it would be a resurrection. It would be impossible for you to deny that he resurrected. And he is coming here from strictly a legal, secular standpoint. He declared it would have been impossible for the disciples to persist with their conviction that Jesus had written if they had not actually seen the risen Christ who moved the stone this morning. Another famous scholar was an atheist. He was a skeptic. His name is C.S. Lewis. He has come to be known today as one of the greatest apologists for the Christian faith. And this is what C.S. Lewis wrote. Something perfectly new in the history of the universe had happened, had happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ had defeated death, C.S. Lewis writes. The door which was always been locked had for the first time been forced open, the doors of death, the stone on the tomb. My dear brothers and sisters, yes indeed, something new has happened and Paul tells us about it in the book of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. He says, therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, 
He is a new creature. All things are passed away. And all things are become new. I'm a walking, living example. Oh yes, something happened. Something happened. Death was defeated. Jesus himself. The resurrected Jesus would appear to his servant John in the Mount of Patmos and he came and he, in my imagination, he had some keys in his hand and he declared, he declared, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys to hell and death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, I want you to know that. He is the one that rolled away the stone. No wonder they couldn't find anyone to convict for breaking the Roman seal. Because the Jesus whom they had in the tomb, he is the one. He is the one that moved the stone. The Jesus Christ. He is the greatest human being that has ever walked planet Earth, if you would call him a human being. In fact, Amen. he is the governor of the galaxies and the master of the universe. But he condescended to come in, in sinful flesh like you and I to prove to the world that even, even in this condition that we could overcome and conquer sin, that's what the resurrection is all about. Jesus had no earthly kingdom, but his followers, we call him ruler. Oh, he has no theological degree, no, no letters behind his name, but uh, we call him the master teacher. Amen. He had no uh, medical degree, never went to medical school, but they call him the great healer, Amen. the great physician. He had no army. Oh yes, but the kings they were afraid of him. He never fought. He never. Uh, he, he did not win any military battles because he had no army. But yet, he has conquered the entire world. At least those of us that want to accept him as Lord and Savior, he committed no crime. He committed no crime, but yet they crucified him. He was buried in a grave. But I want you to know that he is alive. The Apostle Paul would write to the Hebrews, Wherefore he is able to also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, that come unto God by him, see it that he ever liveth to make intercession. Oh, he's alive and he's calling you this morning. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest what's troubling you today. I want you to know the one that rolled away the tomb, that rolled away the stone from the tomb, would roll away those stones from your life. Darkness and, and error and pain and heartache and fear. He wants to roll them away. The Apostle Paul tells us again back in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all, we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, Paul continues. So when this corruptible would have put on incorruption, and this mortal would have put on immortality, then shall be brought to, the, to pass the same. Death is swallowed up in the grave. <coughs> Calvary. The resurrection. O death, Paul continues, where is thy sting? O grave, he asks, where is thy victory? 
The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through Christ Jesus. The man on the cross, the man in the tomb, the one that rolled away, the rolled away the stone from the tomb. Oh yes, he declared. He looked up, he, he declared. No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down and I pick it up. And in creed, and indeed he did. My dear brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, but because Jesus was resurrected, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John was able to write. The Apostle Paul was able to write. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Talking about those that had rejected him, they would wail. But you and I that accept the resurrection, you and I that accept the perfect life that he has lived, you and I that have accepted him to come into our lives and to, to change us, to be more like him. John continues to write, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Amen. for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, Amen. and there was no more sea, no more separation. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride prepared for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, he will dwell with us. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with us. And be there can be our God, and God shall wipe away our tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things would have passed away. My dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know this morning that the answer to the question to Frank Marson's, uh, 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 the answer to Frank Marson's question who moved the stone is the one, the very one, that was sealed in the tomb by the stone. Amen. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. And just as he from inside the tomb was able to move the stone, you invite him into your life Amen. and he will remove the stones of your life. Amen. What are they? Fear, insecurity, doubt? false doctrines, he wants to remove them. The night before he was crucified, he gathered with his disciples to have their last fellowship meal together and he basically tell them that, fellas, I've been telling you all for three and a half years that I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to be resurrected. I don't know if you guys remember now, fellas, but this is it. They're going to kill me tomorrow. And his disciples now began to, to look very sad and perturbed. And I don't know about you, but if I was one of them, I would have been, I would have been sad and perturbed too. Because for, for three and a half years, as they walked with him on the dusty streets of, of Palestine, Everywhere that they went, they saw the great healer, the great physician. He touched the blind and made them see. He touched the dumb and they were able to walk. He touched the deaf and they began to hear. Oh yes, he touched the lame and they began to walk. He even raised the dead from the grave. And so they looked very worried and very troubled. And I want to share with you today what he shared with them and what he's saying to you and I today. 
It has come down through the corridors of time to you and I. He says, let not your heart be troubled. What is worrying you today? Coronavirus? Your job? What's troubling you? Jesus. The one who rolled away the stone. The one who conquered death. The one who healed the sick and, 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 and raised the dead. He is saying to you this morning, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me, in my Father's house. Our many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that he may be there also. Amen. Oh, yes. Frank Morrison, he is dead now. His book was written around 1930. Of course, he answered the question himself. But the title of the book, as I said, was Who, Ru Who Moved the Stone? It was Jesus. The very one that they had crucified. The very one that they had put a crown of thorns upon his head and, and spat in his face and pulled his beard. The very one that they had put the rusty nails in his hand and the pierced his side with the old rusty Roman cross. But he promised that he will come again. And he's not coming for anyone to abuse him. He's coming as Lord and Lords and King of Kings. He's coming for those who believe in his resurrection. He's coming for those who believe in his resurrection and on account of their belief, that they accept him in their lives and allow him to transform their lives. He's not coming for those who think that the way we celebrate his resurrection is one day a week and once a year we have a grand celebration where you just sing and swing and continue to sin and celebrate. Oh no, that's not what the resurrection is all about. The resurrection is becoming like Jesus. The resurrection, we're told by John again in the book of, of, of 1 John. The book of 1 John, the third chapter, this is what John says. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. He says, Behold, how are we the sons of God, and, that, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when he shall come, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be like him. We'll be able to stand the glory of his divinity. Amen. That's what the resurrection is all about. You may have celebrated last week. You might be planning on going to celebrate tomorrow. I'm not condemning you. Jesus is not condemning you. But Jesus just wants you to know the word of truth. And sometimes the word of truth is harsh. But I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And as his servant, I love you too. Get away from the celebrations and get into the transformation. So that the world may know that Jesus has come. It's not going to be too distant. When he shall burst the clouds. The, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says, Lo, he says, this is our Lord and our God, and we have waited uh, for him, and he will save us. My brothers and sisters, when he comes, we want to be in that number, in that group. In that group where Matthew recorded that Jesus declares, Come ye blessed of my Father, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Amen. Jesus knows what you're going through. He even knows that you are deceived. Oh yes, he wrote about it, but he also is giving you the invitation today. Come out to her, my people. 
come out to her, my people. And why is he sending this message? Is because he's about to act. Oh, and we'll talk about his actions shortly, not too distant, maybe in a couple of weeks. What those acts would be. And why he's telling you to come out of her. Come out of Babylon, mystery Babylon, the mud of harlots and abominations of the world. Come out from that persecuting people that has killed so many of God's people over the ages and is now taking control of the world again as God allows. God wants us, the entire world, the entire universe, to see the fullness of sin and the man of sin. And then he laughed. He's about to act. But he's giving you another opportunity today to come out of her. I don't know where you are. Only you and God knows. But he's asked me to tell you this morning that his resurrection is real. Amen. He asked me to tell you this morning, just as everything else that was prophesied about him has been fulfilled. When he will be born, where he will be born, how he will be born, when he would begin his ministry, when he would die, oh yes, and when he would be resurrected, he's not, he's a God that does not lie, and when he says he's coming again, yes indeed, he's coming again. The question is, for you and I to decide if we want to be on his side. I plan on being there when he comes to meet him, to be in that number that look up and welcome him as our Lord and Savior. The question is, do you want to be? I invite you. I invite you to accept him so that we all will go home to spend eternity with him. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for speaking to us today. Yea, even through this utterly worthless piece of clay. Yes. And Father, we pray that the words that were spoken today, that they would touch some heart. In fact, we are assured that they will, because you have said that your word would never return unto you void, but it would go forth and accomplish the task for which they were spoken, and that is to transform our lives to present your son and his saving grace. May someone this morning in the hearing of my voice accept you, give their lives to you. Yes. And those of us that have done that before, may we be strengthened. Yes. May we be edified, may our confidence be strengthened today that surely he who moved the stone would come again to take us home to spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with him is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen.